All right, we are moving on, still on 6, and we have moved now down to 6D, consideration of market study implementation. Let's get a 6C, Mr. Mayor. Oops. 6, yes, thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> yep, I saw the short term and thought we were done with it. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> 6C, consideration of short-term rental licensing fees and administrative fines. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chansky. So, at, so when you adopted the, the uh, licensing ordinance in July, we said we'd be coming back with some recommendations on the fees for the licensing as well as administrative fines. Um, as our current ordinance um, doesn't have anything, obviously, regarding the fees because it's a new license and administrative fines that kind of just leaves it open. It says we can issue administrative fines, but a recommendation to actually have an actual fine, um, what that number is. So after kind of looking at areas around what they do for short-term rentals, uh, we're just recommending a short-term rental license fee of $300. That is per year. Uh, just so as, uh, you know, just see where that meets around other places. Crow Wing County, they do it by bedrooms, so they do you know two hundred dollars for two bedrooms or less, three hundred for three to four bedrooms, four to five six, five hundred seven or more. Um, personally, it's just easier if it's just a flat fee. We feel that three hundred is a pretty appropriate number for any cost that city may incur issuing the licenses, doing enforcement inspections, etc. Uh, the city of Brainerd, which is the only one, also the ones that I could really see. Um, that had their own ordinance. They charge $250 for the interim use permit, and then you also have to get a, an annual short-term rental license of $32 per unit. Uh, then also regarding uh, administrative citations, uh, recommendation is $500 per violation as described in section 115.005, so that's the enforcement section of the licensing ordinance. So to clarify how this would work, if we get a complaint, we first, you know, we have to verify it. If it is a verifiable complaint that they are, they have violated the ordinance in some way, uh, they are sent a violation notice. They're given a certain amount of days to correct it, and then obviously they need to um, report back to the city how they corrected that issue. If there is no compliance within the amount of time listed in that notice, that's when we would issue the five hundred dollar um, citation. Um, just to clarify, in the ordinance, uh, we have that strike method where they have so many, I think it's three violations within 18 months, they're eligible to lose their license. That strike happens when we get that verifiable complaint, not necessarily when we give, issue the citation. The citation is just the extra thing of, stop. we advise you not to ignore the city. You're, gonna, you're already getting a strike because you violated it. We want you to comply, otherwise you're also going to get a monetary fine. Um, so those are the two recommendations that we have staff has had. Um, if you do choose to adopt those recommendations, uh, we do recommend you adopt them in a resolution format, which we have ad uh, attached to the packet. And I'll take any questions the council has. Thank you. Questions from the council? Pretty straightforward. I was comfortable with the amount. I am up to the uh, $500 and let some teeth in it. Yeah, no, you mean the five? Yeah, I'm good with the. 750 minimum, I'd like to see the thousand. So you'd like to see it from 500 to 1,000, is what you're saying? Yeah, I would. That's some real teeth. I would not want to pay a thousand dollar fine. Okay, other comments? I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with the 500 at this point. Um, I could also see a graduated. So if they had uh, one violation uh, that we fined them for, and then the second violation would be a thousand, and then uh, maybe a third violation would be two thousand, something like that, a graduated. Council member, I, I don't know. I, I guess I think five hundred dollars is is so okay and appropriate for now. Um, knowing we can always adjust it in right. the future if there should be issues. And a graduated one would just, I feel like, be more difficult to, inf uh, maybe administratively, maybe not based on reaction, but well, maybe I mean. They, maybe they can't afford it and they can't give it up. You gotta have some teeth in this stuff. Yeah. Well, $500 seems like a lot of money Same, to me, but. You know, <laughs> well, I, 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 I would, yeah, I mean, some, I see it both ways. I mean, on one hand, 500 is pretty significant, but then I think about the fact that they'd earn that back in one night. 
hands down, <laughs> and what they're charging. <laughs> I mean, when you think about five hundred dollars, but you bet. You bet. to a degree. But at the same time, you know, I, I the graduated has some merit. I mean, I could see that potentially saying, you know, strike one's five hundred, strike two's a thousand, or you know, something of that nature. Administrator Chansky, you want to... Uh, just a reminder for Councilmember Bach and your uh, microphone. What about... It's sitting on the desk. Yeah. It's on the desk. It's, it's giving me a headache. Okay. I'll Deb can't... turn it off and speak loud. Well, Deb can't hear you. She just let me know that... It, or if you hold can at least, or if you can at least hold it up when, when you're speaking. All. Right. Okay. So that we can be on the recording. Thank you. Joe taught me that. There you go. See? There we go. There you go. Hi, Deb. That works. <laughs> Thank you. I'm comfortable okay. with the 500 and the graduated. And next time we're at 1,000, yeah, 500 off the shoot. I'll, I'll buy that. So how, how would we look at that? So the first, first violation would be 500. Second violation would be 1,000. Do we, do we want to go to an amount of a third violation? Well, I guess the third violation would done. be they would be they, done. They, they would lose, lose their, their license. They lose their license. Exactly. So. Exactly. No. So no it'd be a it'd be a graduated from a five hundred thousand license out. That's what we're looking at. That sounds. I, I don't. Sounds good I'm to not me. opposed to that. I mean, and again, we can always come back and revisit that too. Yeah. Fine. I mean, at the level of uh, the level of the administrative end of it, I don't think is that much because you're going to have documented if they were violated. Right. So you know that. You know then they've already paid the one fine. You're going to have that on record. So if they get a second violation, it's easy. There it is. There's number one. Well, number two. And to clarify, too, is if we send them a violation, you know, they send the violation notice, they don't respond. We send them actually, a, you know, a citation. Right. And then if within a certain amount of period they still don't respond, right. then we're sending a second. So it would be, you know, then, the, you know, then you're getting the $1,000. So if, right. you know. For not complying, you're getting, you're getting fifteen hundred, and then right. if you haven't complied after that, that's when we'd be bringing it yep. back and saying, "Okay, we recommend revocation of this license." Revocation of license. Yep. Okay, so it looks like then we would want that change then to be five hundred provide uh, five hundred for verse vi so citation fee change to five hundred for first violation, thousand for second violation. Third would be a revocation. Right, the third would, and it still is at this point. Yeah. That's the yeah. third would still be revocation, whether we change that or not. So, yeah. um, and another thing to clarify is that's in an 18 month period. Yes. And it's a rolling 18 month. Yes, it is. So it does after 18 months, it doesn't reset. Right. <laughs> yeah. Off the call question, uh, if I may, Mr. Mayor, uh, if they sell out. You, they get it January 1st and they decide to sell. Does that run with the property? It runs with the license. Runs with the license. So right. a new property owner needs to come and get, has to relicense themselves. Yep. Starts over from scratch. Yes, sir. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so basically then we need to have the resolution amended uh, based on what we would like to see changed in there. Um, so do I have a motion to... Um, have the city administrator amend the resolution and bring it back or you can bring it back or you can just adopt it as amended just adopt it That's then. okay yeah okay do i have a motion so i have a motion from councilmember bakken okay. second from councilmember little high to approve resolution 18-2022 a resolution setting the fees for short-term rental licenses and administrative citations as amended by the council to reflect Five hundred dollars for first violation, a thousand dollars for second violation. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Abstentions. Motion carries. One thing I would like to recommend, maybe later on down the road, is <laughs> that we would have like a public forum to go over the details of this new ordinance because there's some subtleties in there. Um, one of the things that came up at the uh, end of the planning and zoning meeting, uh, it was brought up by uh, White Birch. Uh, they have a couple properties that they own mm -hmm. and they operate, mm -hmm. you know, basically outside the uh, resort commercial. And then they also manage 
a property that is owned by a third party, okay? And that third party would have to get a license and it would have to be, man and White Birch would be the, the manager of it yeah. and they would have to now comply with our ordinance right. where they would have to have somebody available to answer the question 24-7. Yeah. And that is, and it can't be an answering machine, you know, it has to be an actual person that answers it. This is some of these little subtle things that are going to have to come out. No, oh, I agree 100%. I I've actually it mentioned it to Administrator Chansky about having an education opportunity because right. there's a lot of information here that people need to understand. Right. Because by doing that, now the city is doing their part to educate and provide the information and go over it with them. And after that, if they don't abide by it, then it's on them. Right, and especially for the for the neighbors because they're actually going to be part of the enforcement. Yep. You know, yeah, perfect. I was thinking something along open forum, open house, something like that. People right. can come in, we'll discuss the whole piece, how it's run, go through the administrative fees, the application process, <clears throat> all that different stuff so that they all have it. So. Especially for the uh, people that have the licenses right now yeah. from the county. Yep. That'd be very important for them to understand how all this is going to work. So I agree. Yep. yep. It might be good to have it when, when everything's sort of ready, because mm -hmm. maybe you can actually get the application. That's what I was thinking. Completed. Yep. At the beginning time. of January, right there, and have it, and then they could, if they wanted to, have the opportunity to apply or take the at least information with them, so they can bring it home, fill it out, and bring it back in. So I agree. Yep. Yep. Probably in that first part of January is what you're looking at. So, okay. Okay, hey, item 6D. Uh, Mr. Mayor, did you actually hold the formal vote on that? Yes. We did? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we approved it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we did. That was a comment afterwards. Okay. Yep. That's what I was yeah, I was going to say, I, I didn't forget that one. <laughs> I got a little confused there for a second. Nope, nope. Yeah, we did approve uh, the resolution as amended in, uh, based on the things that we discussed. All and right. Then we started talking about... Let's have an open house. Yeah, the education everybody. piece. Yep, the education piece. Councilman Lillehigh added another comment. <laughs> idea. Yes, it is. It's very good. We need to do that. I agree 100%. 6D, consideration of market study implementation. Administrator Chansky. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, again, this is coming from the, the market study that the council approved back in January. So, oh, sorry, July. Um, so, we do have... The, the formal results and the uh, recommendation from the personnel committee and also uh, Rachel Skaggs, who's our consultant with uh, GovHR, is also here um, if you have any questions. But I'm just going to run through the recommendations um, quickly for you. Uh, so the full study was attached to your packet. I won't go through that unless you have any questions. And I'll just go hit the high points. A um, couple of the big changes to that, the personnel committee is is recommending is first of all uh, is to implement this the proposed salary plan that's shown on page 12 of the final report um, and effective January 1 of 2023 so not effective immediately but effective at the beginning of the year a couple of the changes uh, first of all they're recommending going from a from our current 12-step plan so again, with every grade, every staff position has a grade, and then within that there are 12 steps of how you increase through um, the wage steps. Steps 11 and 12 currently operate as longevity steps. You achieve step 11 after 10 years of service and, and step 12 after 15 years of service. And move to a eight-step grid with no longevity element. Um, so this is a primary impetus would be changes for recruitment and retention of employees. It offers employees the opportunity to move through the grades faster, encourages them to stay, and also discourages them from leaving. Um, the main idea behind that is if an employee is looking at another organization, for example, a similar position, while maybe the city's position, the, that first step may not be as high as another organization's first step base wage, in two or three years because their step is, for example, maybe 14 steps or more. I've seen some that are crazy number of steps. You actually would be making more money here because you get to move up through the grades a little faster. 
Additionally, uh, the proposed salary plan does, uh, unlike now, it does off, we separated police officer, police officer paramedic positions out because those are determined by the weight, by the contract. We're discussing that later today, so we just removed those, so those no longer are part of this grid. Um, and then also, uh, we are proposing amending, uh, going, sending an amendment back to uh, LELS local number 359 um, with if this changes to the grid going from a 12 step to an 8 step um, going back proposing that we do the same to their contract again their contract is currently listed at 12 amending that to 8 and the last thing they considered um, was adding a police officer EMT grade uh, as you know, right now we have police officer and we have police officer paramedic. Police officer paramedics are required to be a licensed paramedic, uh, maintain their licensure, and maintain casual employment through North Memorial Ambul Ambulance. The intention with the police officer paramedic grade would be the same requirements. You have to be a licensed EMT, you have to maintain your license at EMT, and you would have to main ca maintain casual employment with North Memorial Ambulance. I've already discussed this. Um, I know the chief has discussed this with North Memorial, and they are open to that as well. Um, and we'd be no open to um, doing having the same uh, situation with our paramedics, where for EMTs, um, equipping them with the uh, material, the equipment that an EMT would be needing. Um, the idea behind this is it would it would encourage officers to seek further medical training. Right now, going from essentially nothing, just going from first responder that all police officers are required to do to paramedic is a really big jump. You know, you're talking a year plus of schooling and all of that learning. Um, and so maybe this is kind of the intermediate grade. We'll maybe go to EMT first, see how you like it. Um, and again, and by doing that also, it benefits our residents because then those officers have that extra training um, for whether if when they're on call, um, on, on duty, or even if they live within the community and they can respond while they're off duty, we've had our paramedics do that many times. Where um, you know we just gave Sergeant Garcia a life-saving award back in May for a call that he responded to when he was off duty. Um, so again, it's just a benefit to our community of having those trained professionals um, on staff. So again, the main changes with implementing uh, the the changes the uh, um, the what we found in the market study. Again, we found, we we uh, surveyed 13 communities that were determined to be um, comparable to the city of Breezy Point um, against their positions. Again, all that data is in the full report. If you want to review, it, if you have any questions on it, we can ask you. We can answer that. Um, we went to the 50th percentile of of all, those, of all those cities and all those grades, we went to the 50th percentile. That's the general recommendation that GovHR has. Um, and so with that proposal, looking at the cost to implement, you'll see in the study it tells about $27,000 to implement. Um, that's if over what we're doing right now. Um, in the preliminary budget that you adopted in September, we had already incorporated a 5% cost of living increase. So the adjustments above that would cost a, roughly an additional $15,500, and that covers everything that's wages, FICA, Medicare, retirement. So a total package of roughly an additional $15,500 of them what was in the preliminary budget. Um, I'm not. I'm confident that there's enough area within that budget that if the council chooses to adopt these recommendations, we can make this, fit this into the budget without having any um, negative impact to the final budget. Um, so with that, Mr. Mayor, myself, Rachel, we're available to uh, answer any questions that you may have about this market study and the recommendations that have been submitted to you. Thank you, Administrator Chansky. Council, any questions? No current mm. questions. Ready to make the motion. I don't have any questions. Okay, no Thank questions, you. Council Member Lillard. No, I'm comfortable with it. All right, very comfortable with it. Fire. I would move the city adopts this uh, as presented by the administrator. And in my opinion, you can't pay these people enough, like a teacher. It should be double what it is, in my opinion. <laughs> Oh, no, no, I'll carry the flag, mm -mm. I'm done. 
Okay, so motion to approve resolution 19-2022, a resolution implementing a salary plan and setting employee wages made by Council Member Bakken. Do I have a second? second. I have a second from Council Member Ball. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you for the presentation. And thank you to uh, Rachel. Rachel, you for did your work as job. well. <laughs> Thanks. There she was, and she disappeared. I was going to say thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for your work for us, too. We appreciate it. All right. Yep, I'm muted. That's the problem. Okay. Number six E approval of hiring Kyle Rustad as part time police officer. Yep, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, also, the personnel can be mentioned earlier. Um, uh, Chief Sandell brought before the personnel committee a recommendation to, Kyle, to hire Kyle Rusted as, as uh, a, an additional part-time officer. There really is no cost to the city for this hire except, uh, again, it just gives us more flexibility to have coverage when we have officers in training or officers on vacation. Uh, right now we just have the one part-time officer. Um, so, you know, if that part-time officer is not available, maybe Kyle's going to be available or vice versa to provide us some just extra coverage when we need it. Um, and then we do already have a budgeted um, funds for part-time officers each year. Um, again, a little bit of Kyle. Kyle is an EMT with North Memorial currently, and he is obviously a licensed peace officer. Um, the intent, as we discussed it with um, the personnel committee, is that we would bring Kyle on as a, as a part-time officer, um, and if the council does approve the seventh full-time police officer in December, is that the recommendation would likely then be, if, again, Kyle continues to work out, would likely to be to promote Kyle to that full-time position in January. And we, at that time, once that position is formally approved, we would then bring a recommendation to that at that time. But at this time, we're just recommending the hiring of Kyle Rustad as a part-time police officer to be paid step one of the police officer wage grade, which is $25.05 an hour. Okay. Thank you for the update. Any comments, questions? None. Okay. No. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion. I have a motion from Councilmember Ball and a second from Councilmember Bakken to approve the hiring of Kyle Rustad as our part-time police officer. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. 6F, approval of Bushman Road RFP. Administrator Chansky, you want to give us a brief little update on this? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. So the... Road Committee has been looking at Bushman Road, where are our next steps after the city had the a feasibility study done by Bolton and Mink last year. Um, as you may remember, there was some hope at that time to hopefully partner with some of the other communities, looking at kind of the entirety of that entire corridor when as Bushman turns into Ackerson, um, as it goes into Pequot, and then also north into Jenkins. Um, haven't really got any traction from those committees. Those communities, but the road committee was adamant that you know we really do need to move forward on our section, what we are responsible to our residents of on Bushman Road. And so, uh, what they made a recommendation to do is to move forward with the reconstruction of Bushman Road uh, at up to a local standard. Um, and what that means is in the proposal, we we'll talked about the different st standards of roads doing up to a local standard. The reason we say up to is because when we look at some of the shoulders. Uh, sizes and even lane, oh, lane widths, we may want to adjust that slightly um, as we get into design. Uh, this would also include the realigning of Bushman Road and Ranchette Drive intersection as part of that proposal, that feasibility discussed that as well, moving that further east. Um, and then directing staff to develop and issue a request for proposals for the engineering and design as well as construction management services for that. So this, pro this RFP is moving forward with engineering design and then assuming you know the council we get through design and council gives the go ahead on actual construction that this engineering firm the select engineering firm would also then act as the construction manager okay. when we look to build hopefully in 2024 
in the packet, I kind of gave you again a little bit an idea of what moving forward will look like. Uh, if you give us this direction to move forward tonight, Daniel and I will actually start working with Joe and drafting that RFP, hopefully getting that out next week or two. Um, then to get back, have responses back in November to have the road committee review, have them make a recommendation for awarding and uh, selecting an engineer in December of 2023, kicking it off right away in January 23, hopefully um, getting everything set to go for bid in early 24, and then reconstruction of Bushman in, 20, in the summer of 2024. So that's kind of high level what we're hoping this process would look like. So I guess tonight we're just looking at uh, authorization, accepting the road committee's recommendation to move forward and then directing staff to, uh, to draft and issue that RFP. Thank you, Administrator Chansky. We did discuss this in the road committee. Um, this is gonna be somewhat fast track uh, to keep us on schedule. Um, and uh, this is a very straightforward way of doing the engineering, so. And I'm happy to see the fast track. So I applaud that. Yeah, I'm glad to see it's not pushed back further. So. No. Right. Yeah. No, we can't on push it, for it back years. further. It needs to be fixed. <laughs> so any other comments? Hearing none, do I have a motion to uh, approve the staff going uh, to put together an RFPA so to moved. go out for the engineering design? So moved. I have a motion from Councilmember Lillehi. Do I have a second? I have a second. I have a second from Councilmember Ball. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? <clears throat> motion carries. All right. We are now on to item seven, administrator updates. There's two of them. I will turn it over to Administrator Chansky for the updates. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I've got two listed and just a couple of brief things thereafter. Uh, the first thing that we wanted to identify is as I presented in the budget, or the pre preliminary budget last month, um, we are budgeting to implement body-worn cameras for their police department in 2023. Uh, there is a statutory process, believe it or not, that we have to follow before we can even actually purchase these cameras. Um, and that starts with allowing the public the opportunity to comment to the police department regarding their feelings around body-worn cameras, whether they're in favor, if they have concerns around the body-worn cameras. After that, the council, as you are the, the, um, the body that holds the purse strings, has to conduct your own public hearing. And then finally, the public has to have the opportunity to comment on the formal policy that we must adopt around body-worn cameras. So what we're just kind of here and really announcing tonight um, is that effective today, we are taking comment. Um, until November, Tuesday, November 1st on body-worn cameras and people's feelings regarding implementing them. Um, if you go to the city's website, we've also posted it to the city's Facebook page. You can find the information of that. We even actually have a draft of the policy as well already out there. Um, and then uh, your, your comments can be issued to the police department directly. And then kind of moving forward after uh, Janu uh, November 1st at your meeting in December. Um, we found it appropriate as you'll be looking to adopt the budget. At that time, we'll have the council hold the public hearing. That way, if you get any comments um, that make you want to potentially hold off on adopting the body-worn cameras, we can just potentially have them removed from the budget. Just before that's all approved, let's have the council do that at that time. And then our goal is then in January, um, have the public again continue to have opportunity to comment on the policy, have the council adopt the policy in February 2023, and then the police department can go ahead and purchase those body cameras. Um, so that's really where we are at that. So that's just public comment is open for body worn cameras. Uh, second item we had on there, and I'll be turning this over to Joe. Um, he just had a update on the sewer plant capacity and where we're at with the sewer plant. As you may remember, um, as again, part of the preliminary budget, we discussed do, looking at doing a sewer expansion study in 2023. And I think Joe's just kind of walked through where we're at right now and kind of give you an idea of why we're moving in that direction. So I'll hand it over to Joe to briefly walk through that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> on the first page, uh, while we're going to discuss 
I'll just go over is the treatment facility itself, uh, influent treatment capacity, effluent treatment capacity, winter storage capacity. These are kind of our three um, areas you monitor closely. Um, they're related, but they're not necessarily tied at a hip. Uh, like our influent treatment capacity, for example, greatly exceeds what we can store or what we could irrigate. Um, and then ERU history, um, that's the amount of ERU accounts we have. Um, it kind of it shows uh, increased connections and then sewer stub availability. And I'll just give a brief summary. Uh, highlights of the wastewater treatment facility built in 78. Um, it's a small concrete structure, primarily holds a... Uh, electronic uh, breakers, start motor starters, that sort of things, uh, small office space, a bar screen. Um, starting to see some wear and tear on the concrete from uh, hydrogen sulfide corrosion. Um, it's not surprising. Uh, and then some other components um, like the, the Control panels that run our aerators and such things, I mean, they're 42 years old. Uh, I would anticipate, and irrigation pumps, those are gonna have to be increased, so obviously the amperage load, I would expect, is gonna have to increase quite a bit. So um, going down the road, I would anticipate whenever we're gonna increase our irrigation capacity or possibly our aeration capacity, I would expect something to happen. You could either new structure, major rehab, um, nothing's inhibiting current operation, everything is functional. Um, I would anticipate we would see something, you'd want to tie upgrades to that structure whenever we increase our, our treatment capacity and our effluent capacity because I'm pretty confident uh, the electrical system would need to be drastically upgraded. Uh, influent treatment capacity, no major problems there. Um, we're less than half capacity as far as what we could treat. That, that doesn't mean what we can dispose of or what we can store. Um, that's what I'm getting at. Uh, a couple issues is half of our treatment capacity though is, right now we use a pond as storage. Um, it doesn't work optimally. I would recommend, you know, down the road when it gets to it, we look at something to modernize that. That was the original aeration equipment in 1978. Um, it's not efficient anymore. I think there's a better solution to it. Um, and I, I would also, cons you know, that could be done when you're working on the, the electrical component. Um, they're kind of tied to how much electricity they draw goes into our into the sewer plant. Um, that would make a, a logical time to look at that five to ten years probably. Um, and then these are the bigger items. It'd be the effluent capacity. Um, effluent capacity. We have a rigid number of 72 million gallons per year is what we should not exceed. Um, Generally, the MPCA recommends when you reach 80 to 85 percent of that capacity, you should start considering expansion so you don't push yourself up against limits. Um, you know, stop issuing building permits, connections, that sort of thing. Um, the older uh, 2011 study, um, they anticipated 2035. Um, I think that was. Uh, what I'm seeing, I think we're going to reach 85% sooner. I, I would say probably five years, maybe 10. It's uh, partially connected to building, and it can also be connected to um, existing connections just becoming more busier. For example, the resort, um, you know, they're not booked every day. That could greatly swing our effluent, but um, that's what I'm or our 
what we need to get rid of. Um, another recommendation I would look at would be automating our spray field zones. Um, right now they're manu manually turned every day, so it limits how much water we can produce per day. Um, I think down the road is you increase the amount of water we spray. Um, it's not feasible to be staffed 16 hours a day or something like that. Um, most other sewer plants with above ground irrigation are automated. I, I think that'd be appropriate at the time. Um, when we're looking at like how much effluent capacity we currently, like this includes all the land we have and some of the options I could conceive um, you know, if we'd use all our land, change our cover crops, we could see up to 150% increase. So, I mean, that's a significant um, forethought previous councils had put into acquiring land. Um, land's a huge expense and we're adequate for irrigation land. Um, we could also change cover crops that can, you know, presently we're limited two feet of water, go to three feet of water, that's 30%. 3% more on the existing ground, but that would be contingent on MPCA approval. Uh, next big one is winter storage capacity. And this is just from basically October to April, May, depends on the year. All sewage coming to the sewer plant must be stored all winter long. We don't discharge. Um, typically, summertime, we're seeing two to three times more coming into the plant. Winter slows down, so, um, and the chart you see on there, uh, that big dip was when COVID hit, and it's a fairly short data set, so that graph, um, that graph indicates more time. I think we're gonna come, I would anticipate this year, we're gonna be right back to where we were probably 2019 which is getting real close to that 80%. I would say less than five years will be 80%, 80 to 85 probably. Um, one issue could be our existing city property uh, where the ponds are currently configured. You could uh, have an odd shaped pond. The available land is kind of irregular. Um, there's options. You can sacrifice spray fields to create ponds. That's been done in the past. Or you can uh, secure more land. And it also depends on the pond size. Just because we need to expand, that doesn't mean we need to maximize our system. I think that would be the study David was talking about when we would get our engineers involved. That's where you determine your size. Um, and I would, in, yeah, I would anticipate five years we're going to be there without any problems. Um, ERUs, that's pretty straightforward. You see, you know, since the sewer plant started, we started at 400 and we're, I think we're close to 1,440. ERU, what it means is equivalent, uh, basically it's a one residential unit. Um, so a hotel could be 20 ERUs, if, but it accounts for one connection, whereas one home accounts for one ERU. A duplex would account for two ERUs, two family units. Um, some seasonal places we do have account for a fraction of an ERU, like camping clusters, for example. They're not open all year. Um, and then in our sewer district, I would estimate there's less than 10 homes that presently have sewer available to them, but they're not hooked up. So it's not like we have bunch of people that could uh, need to be hooked up immediately. Um, based on old study from 2011, um, they estimated our capacity and um, at 1604, based on 2022, we're at 1440. So roughly there's 164 connections available right now. So. That could be, you know, 164 homes, or it could you could get a super high water use uh, place come in, and they could suck them all up, which not likely. Uh, we don't have that kind of commercial space where you'd see that. But um, and then sewer stub availability, you know, this is all those sewer stubs in our city. It's approximately 1,300. I, 
counted them on our maps. Um, the ones in use, I looked through GIS, counted the roads, uh, subtracted how many homes from how many are available. 55% um, of our stubs are in use, 45% of our stubs are available. So theoretically we could, you know, without changing anything, our water flow could double, sort of, because mostly it'd be residential, like we wouldn't have the room to increase our commercial, like we couldn't build another resort obviously, but residential homes could go up quite a bit. Um, a point that is the actual stubs available though, however, with less, and what I mean by that is we have multiple lots where there's three lots combined and it's one residential structure. They have three stubs in the ground, they're using one. It's unlikely to change. Um, I didn't investigate how many, but I know it's multiple places have more than one stub. That's not uncommon. Um, so, but regardless, there's quite a bit of room for growth on our existing sewer system. Um, sewer connections from 2011 to present day, um, you know, 10 to 15 a year, I think would be a good average. Um, last few years have been busier, um, but you could see not that long ago, it was pretty slow. Uh, yeah, and then my summary, pond capacity, I would say five years planning. Uh, we should start thinking about that. Um, pond locations, that I think that could be kind of, take some deeper thought. Effluent capacity, five years. Um, automation of the, the irrigation fields, I'd really rec feel that would be a good way to go. Um, look at this, the const control structures in the sewer plant, update pond one aeration, um, and then uh, there's, a, there's a connecting pipe between our ponds. Um, we can operate with the pipe not working. It's kind of unfortunate, uh, it's more of a nuisance. I'd also recommend, you know, when we do our expansion or to consider to get it fixed at that time. And then, uh, yeah, this is just kind of my feeling on based on the numbers I've seen. Um, any questions? Council, any questions? Five, I would say five years for a pond. Five to ten years. At the end of the five years? Gary, your Mike. mic. Thank you. At the end of the five years, you start, or two years down the road? I would start the process of, and that's what David discussed, is do this, the sewer study, and that will get the process going. We'll get better targets. Um, we'll identify, you know, where else would you like to see sewer spread to? Um, maybe you don't. You know, if there's limited growth available, that's going to frame on how much growth you want to do. Because you don't necessarily, just because we have a lot of space available, um, if we don't need it all, there's no sense using it immediately, I would, I would guess. So well, I think we have sufficient time to make very educated, smart choices. In that, Mr. Mayor, that's again, that's the impetus of why we want to do that study in 23 is to look at all the things that pretty much Joe just identified um, and figure out how do we want to move forward. Uh, again, because all of this will require funds. Um, we do have a pretty sewer, a healthy sewer fund, uh, but that on any kind of project this size can be depleted quickly. So really, again, that, that, that study would be looking at, you know, our current plant, what do we got, what do we, how, how can we expand it, what ways should it be expanded, and then also be looking at, again, as, as Joe just um, alluded to, is also looking at, do we want to just, you know, is there any desire to expand our system into the future, because that will affect how we size the plant into the future as well. Yeah, and my comment is, first of all, great presentation, thank you very much for that. Very informative and a lot of good information there. I think the second thing is I see it as there's several 
things there that need to be looked at sooner rather than later, but then others that are more far out. So I potentially, and based on what the study would show us, could see it being a phased approach where we continue to start to work and say, okay, we need to address this first, which when you do that, then you're addressing the others as you go. So they're all connected together, but it's about how it all works in that phase and fashion. And I think that ultimately is probably what we need to do moving forward. So I think that study is the first good good thing to get so that we can have the most up-to-date information and then Joe can use that to assess it and working with the people that are doing it to be able to bring something back to council to say, okay, here's step one. Here's where we need to go and this is some potentials and costs and you move forward with that. So I think that's my thoughts. Mm -hmm. so. And this is something we've been working toward for yeah. years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> obviously, we have accumulated a good, healthy sewer fund to be able to pay for the studies, the That's expansion right. of the plant, yep. without having to do any bonding or any, any major expenditures where we pay the bank a whole bunch of money. So we'd be able to pay as we go. That's the whole idea. Um, it is More better so. to start it fairly early so that we can get the plans done. Um, and uh, that way we can minimize the cost because yep. we can spread it out over several years. So, I, I mean, this That's is exactly what I was saying. This is the type of thing that we're a growing community. We need to be adding to our infrastructure on a regular basis, and it's starting to get to the point where we need to uh, move forward on this, and it's an uh, it's opportune time. Let's move ahead on it. I think we've gotten some pretty good mileage, 1978 mm -hmm. till now, so. <laughs> I will have to say that this plant was originally designed to be very robust, yes. and it has served the city very well. Wow. And um, we just continue along that track, keeping a robust design yep. and keeping, and the other thing is, you know, and this is where I give Joe a lot of credit, as well as John Manier, the guy that was in charge of it before. Um, the plant has been operated in excellent fashion. Year after year, we have received an award <clears throat> for continuous uh, compliance with the state standards. I remember going to one of our, one of the presentations for the, uh, for the uh, Department of uh, uh, Sanitation and they're calling out these awards for these various cities and you know, fifth year award and sixth year award and five year award and they come to Breezy Point and it was like the 30th award and everybody kind of pauses and they go, what? Because yeah. we have operated our plant excellent, excellently for all these years. So, Good deal. All right. Well, I don't think there's any other comments. Uh, but, yeah, I think good presentation. I think it just reinforces what we need to do moving forward. So, Commissioner Chansky, do you have any other <clears throat> brief updates? Three quick things, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, again, uh, updates with our elections. Um, just so the public is also aware, and we'll, there'll be more, it'll be also posted and such. Um, but we will be conducting public testing for the November 8th general election on Thursday, October 19 at 8.30 a.m. at the Land Services Building uh, in Brainerd, the Coleman County Land Services Building. Um, the public is invited to attend that, and you are uh, able to attend that, pub that public testing. That's where we run through our equipment, make sure everything comes out correctly prior to the election. Um, we run through it and then the, everything is sealed up and it's not touched again until the election to ensure uh, that, that, that accountability on that, that equipment is running properly. Also quick on elections, absentee voting has opened up. Um, so those who are looking to absentee vote or vote early, you may do so. I just want to put a reminder again that um, all absentee voting is handled by Crow Wing County. So we here at City Hall don't have anything to do with absentee voting. So if you'd like to vote absentee, we request that you give Crow Wing County or go down to Brainerd and pay them a visit and they'll handle all everything for you, uh, getting you the application, getting it sent out to you, and then you'll return that to them. And then uh, about a week before the election, they'll actually do in-person balloting where you actually can go fill out your ballot and put it in the ballot box as opposed to just in your envelope and returning it to them. Uh, also on October, the Monday of uh, mor the morning of Wednesday, October nineteenth, um, we're actually going to be uh, hosting a meeting with the League of Minnesota Cities. We'll actually be coming about every year. They try to do kind of regional visits. 
They sent some of their staff, so a lot of the, the, the deputy director, um, as well as a few other staff members from the league here um, for cities to come in and have a discussion for them, for the cities to know what, what's going on at the league and for the league to hear kind of what's going on locally and how way, ways that they can support uh, this, their, their member cities. And the last thing, again, just a quick update on the disc golf course. Um, Joe and his guys have been hard at work at that, made a lot of progress in the last few weeks. Uh, the new tee boxes are done. Uh, they got the course seated last week. That's all finished. Um, and uh, just talking to Joe, they're going to be start working on paving the new parking lot, getting that all paved, uh, paved out, maybe putting the first layer of gravel on this fall, letting it settle, and then putting the second layer of gravel on next spring, and then looking at um, also getting the new tea baskets in. And then also our new assistant uh, city administrator, Daniel Ike, he's going to actually be working on through the winter, looking at potential of those marketing opportunities for the disc golf course as well. Right. And for those are all the updates I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Yes, welcome, Daniel. Welcome aboard as assistant uh, city administrator. Happy to have you aboard and great to have you working on it. I know that you're already working on some pretty important projects and there's probably a lot more to come. So welcome. So. <laughs> Thanks for the updates, Administrator Chansky. All right, with that, we are going to move to item eight, which is to adjourn to closed session pursuant to Minnesota Statute 13D.03 uh, to consider proposed labor negotiation agreement with LELS Union number 359. So if I would ask the crowd to please, the uh, meeting will now be closed. So.